Hello and very warm welcome to Mednuche News. Here with you with top stories from Turkey and Kurdistan. A Dutch journalist, Fredika Reding, published a book on Roboski massacre with the title of The Jungen Zin Dots means the boys are dead. A Dutch journalist, Frederica Hiedink, who has been living in Turkey for seven years in Ahmet and often visits the village of Roboski, has published a book with the title of The Jungen Zindot Means the Boys Are Dead on Roboski Massacre. Roboski means Kurdish question. When you understand Roboski, you understand the Kurdish question, says Hiedinka. On the night of 28th of December 2011, Turkish armed forces war planes bombed an area on the border of South Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan. The bombs killed 34 mostly young men on their way back from the Iraqi border. They had crossed for trade border from the village of Gulyaz Beju and Roboski in Shirnakhlaban. The author of this book is now with me live from Holland of the book. Joining me now, uh, Frederica uh, Hiedink. Uh, good evening to you, uh, Frederica. Oh, hi. I'm not sure if I pronounce your name well. If I did, I do apologize for that. No, that was okay. That was okay. Uh, Frederica, to start with, I would like to ask you when you heard of the, of the curse for the first time. Just to start with that before we come to your book. Yeah, that's a long time ago, actually, because um, some 20, more than 20 years ago, I used to work as a volunteer shortly for the uh, for a youth magazine of Amnesty International, and in Holland also. And then we, we brought a story about two young Kurdish boys mm -hmm. who were distributing uh, as Gürgen them mm -hmm. and were disappeared, uh, who disappeared while doing that, and they were taken in by security forces. And with, with this magazine, we encourage Dutch youth to uh, write letters to the Turkish authorities to, uh, to release these boys again. Mm -hmm. So th that was kind of my first acquaintance. That was early 90s. So that was really the time it was really bad in, the, in, in Kurdistan and Turkey. What, uh, what made you to decide to go and live in Diyarbakir or Ahmet? Um, it started while doing the research for my book because I wanted to travel easily to Roboski. And if you have to come from Istanbul all the time, it's, you know, it takes like two days before you get there. And I thought if something urgent happens there, then I need to be there fast. So first I decided to live there for like maximum half a year to, do, to finish the book research. But then I liked it and I'm the only foreign journalist uh, based there. So I thought I might as well stay here because there's a lot of important stories to get here that don't get enough attention. So I thought, you know, I stay. And uh, Federico, uh, what was your reaction when you heard about the massacre in Roboski? Well, my first reaction was um, that I really didn't understand what was going on. And that's why I went there the first time after six days after the massacre. Because I heard that the people were, for, exa for example, also working as village guards. And I wondered, if you work as a village guard, do you also need to earn money smuggling? And I heard that some of the boys who died were like 13, 14 years old. And I was wondering why such young boys were smuggling and doing such dangerous work. And, and I also wondered, if the people are village guards, then they must be in touch with the authorities. So how come the authorities don't know that they are smuggling? And if they do know that the people are smuggling, why the hell would they bomb them to death? So I had so many questions that, you know, for a journalist, there's only one thing you can do. You have to go there yourself and find out, you know. So I, I kept going and going to, you know, I wanted to find out what happened. And uh, when you decided to write about that? Well, not immediately. I. Um, I wrote stories for the news agency I worked for in Holland and I wrote a story for a youth magazine and several stories, but really news related. 
also one year after the massacre, for example. But the book, I only thought of a book like 10, 11 months after the massacre happened because the further I dug into the massacre and the further I, you know, it, it also forced me to dig further into Kurdish history and Turkish Republican history. The more I knew about the massacre, the more I thought like, hey, this massacre is like the Kurdish issue on a square kilometer. And once I realized that, then I thought, hey, this could be a book. Because, for example, the people now live in Raboski and Bejur, but before they lived in Sevilla, but Sevilla was burned to the ground in the 90s. And I didn't know that before, but at a certain point, the villagers said to me, like, do you know Sevilla? I never heard of it. And they said, come, we will take you there. It's our old village, and the army burned it down. And the more I learned, the more, the more I knew, like, you know, this explains the whole Kurdish issue. And then I thought, this is a book, you know, I need to put this all together in a book. Uh, Frederica, uh, as you know, some time ago it was announced in Turkey that no one will be named as the responsible of the massacre. Why is, the, why is it like that? Why is it like that? I think um, there's a big answer to that. And the answer is because um, nothing has really changed since the massacre. I think it could happen again tomorrow. And that is because the system hasn't changed. Because Turkey is still built on Turkish nationalism. And this can only be really investigated and thoroughly investigated and independently investigated if the system that the Republic is built on um, is changed. And you see that also with other massacres that have happened in history in other countries, for example, Soweto massacre in South Africa or Bloody Sunday in Northern Ireland. These things could only be really investigated after the system um, was abolished. Like in South Africa, these big massacres against black people were only investigated after apartheid was abolished. So it's the same in Turkey, you know, the whole system has to change and real lasting peace has to be established before this can be thoroughly investigated. So that's why I'm unfortunately not very hopeful that the truth will come out in short term, you know. And then when we come to your book, could you tell us a bit about the contents of the book? Yes, well, what I liked actually is that I found the names of the chapters together are, uh, yeah, sort of make a country. So I tell about the village, um, about the people, about the mountains, of course, are important, about the grounds in which so many people are buried. Also explaining the 90s in which many people were killed by Shitem, for example. Um, and the horizon, and the horizon, I sort of sketch a picture on what Turkey will look like if this massacre is being clear, cleared up. Um, and I dig into history, because when I came to the village for the first time, people, and Kurds still tell me this, if I ask why the massacre happened, they say it was because we are Kurds. Kurds all do musicin, they say. That's all you get, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, when you investigate Kurdish history during the Republic, and for example, the uprising of Sheikh Said um, and their sin massacres mm -hmm. and what happens in the 90s. It could all happen, it all happened because the people were Kurds and because also in international community, nobody cares about Kurds. Mm -hmm. I, for example, also talked to, to Ismail Besici and he also said like there's some sort of a international um, system that is not supporting Kurds, that is denying them uh, their rights and you know so I by sketching this whole history also I, I sketch the reality in which this massacre could happen mm -hmm. because the Turkish state can get away with it you know because they thought a high PKK leader was in the group but he wasn't in the group mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter because you can with the help of the Turkish media, you can tell the people, oh, these were uh, PKK helpers, or what would, were they doing at the border, everybody knows it's a PKK area. So the whole Turkish public easily believes that these people are either PKK helpers, or, you know, they shouldn't be there. So with the help of the media, you can frame this whole issue and everybody will believe you, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's how they get away with it, and that's how I sketch this whole this whole picture in the book, like, you know, how this could happen.
Uh, Frederica, uh, we have limited of time. I've got loads of questions actually to ask you, but unfortunately uh, we've got in limited of time. So the book will be translated to, uh, to it's, only in, uh, it's, it's only published in Dutch and it will be translated to other languages as, as well. Is that, is that yes, true? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm now looking for an English publisher and a Turkish publisher. And when there's an English publisher, then um, it will also be translated to Kurdish. So that would be really cool. But I'm, I think the first translation that will be ready will be the Turkish one, actually. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure yet when, unfortunately. But it will be there. Okay. Well, we're looking forward. Uh, once it's been translated, we're looking forward to read it. Thank you very much for uh, accepting to join our program. And, uh, yeah, congratulations and good luck with your, uh, with your work. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Turkish soldiers attacked people who protested against the construction of a military guard post in Lidja district of Ahmed province on Friday evening. Following a visit to the Martri Ahmed Memorial in the village of Sisa, thousands coming from the main Kurdish city Ahmed and its districts headed towards the Abala Korha military post until they were stopped by hundreds of gendarmerie and police officers before reaching the post for alleged security reasons. Demonstrators, who there with open Kurdish leader Abdullah Ujalan's banners and PKK flags, were attacked as they left the convoy and started to march to the post, chanting the slogans no war. The brutal attack by security forces left three people wounded with rubber bullets, after which protesters closed the Lija Bingo Road to traffic to protest against the attack. The imprisoned Kurdish leads Rob Tullah Ujalan send a message for 8th of March International Women's Day. Ujalan emphasized that women must take their own decisions. They must have their own free spaces, places. You can determine your lives. Kurdish leads Rob Tullah Ujalan wrote the message for 8th of March during the recent visit by the BDP HDP delegation. Ujalan began his message, My dear women comrades, Continuing, for me, the freedom of women is more important than land and culture. A woman must be a freedom fighter. You must liberate yourselves. In his message, Ujalan said the followings. Nothing has affected me, both with sorrow and anger, and elation and enthusiasm, as much as the story of women's slavery and freedom. They must have their own free spaces, places you can determine your lives, make the search for freedom the basis of your work. Don't complain, be creative. When three or four women come together, produce a solution. Trust your femininity. Ujalan emphasized the importance of striving for women's freedom and saying, For a people cannot be free if the women are not free. A revolution is not a revolution if it cannot liberate women. An organization that cannot organize women is not an organization. Ujalan also mentioned second chances and marcheries in his message and emphasized that Your place is not just your homes. You should be everywhere. You must have a say. Women should speak everywhere. If it hadn't been for the women's freedom struggle, women would have continued to live as slaves. The heroines who have been martyred were all precious. I commemorate them all with respect. Sakine's life is an example. Women's liberation is Sakine's struggle. You must uncover what happened to Saikine. Ujalan pointed out the capitalist form of exploitation that women also undergo and said, Women are left out of life. Women should have their due status in the society. Women are the leading force of social transformation. Women should form economic communes. Ujalan also stressed thousands of women were murdered every day and continued, These deaths are worse than war. They take young girls as wives. Then, when they rape them and they die, they treat them like an animal carcass. Another of the biggest problems for women is unemployment. They have removed women from the economy. Women must find their place in society. They are in the vanguard of social change and must establish economic communes. About women's struggle, Ujalan says the followings. Middle East revolution must be developed as a revolution of women's liberation. Equality and freedom can only be sustained through liberation of women. Our revolution is women's revolution. The Kurdish leader Abdullah Ujalan ended his message with following words.
I greet all of you, all the women struggling for liberation full-heartedly, with love, with wisdom, and celebrate your Women's Day. A course in the main Kurdish city, Ahmed's, has banned the Freedom for Ojalan signature campaign launched by the Peace and Democracy Party BDP for the liberation of Kurdish leader Abdullah Ojalan. The ban has reportedly been introduced on the basis of the anti-terror law of the police forces. They announced a signature collection at stands set up by the parts on Friday across the city. The court ruled the confiscation and seizure of the forms opened to the pupil for signature for they were allegedly intended for turning the campaign to a movement for the embracement of Ujalan. The court ruling has also been submitted to the BDP with police forces demanding the delivery of the collected signatures to police authorities. Senior researcher, fellow and journalist Dr. Jonathan Spire spoke about the developments in Rojava, West Kurdistan. Here is the one part of the interview we had with Jonathan. When I was there, it was during the period of the uh, fighting uh, in Serakania. So it was something of an uncertain time, I think, in, in Rojava. And I would say also that the institutions that have since developed were then uh, still very much in an, in an early and embryonic stage uh, of development. Having said that, I've reported on a number of occasions across northern Syria. And uh, this was the, th the third time I'd been into Syria, the first time into Rojava. And I was struck uh, immediately by uh, two things. First of all, just how more peaceful uh, within Rojava, you know, the situation was when compared with the situation further westward in Aleppo city, in Idlib province, somewhere I've also reported from. This is firstly. And secondly, even then, uh, it was clear that there was a more organized, more, more uh, clear centrally organized authority in the Rojava area than when compared to the areas controlled by the uh, Sunni uh, Islamists or Arab rebels. And these were two very uh, striking uh, phenomena. And I think also one thing which was striking was the, uh, you know, the I think effectiveness of the armed forces of the YPG YPG armed forces, mm -hmm. uh, when compared with the Arab rebels. So these were my immediate uh, sensations and uh, and impressions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that since then, uh, if anything, this has become more the case in terms of what I'm what I've heard. That you know, since then, there's now more clear uh, authority on the ground uh, in Rojava when compared to the quite chaotic situation actually elsewhere in northern Syria. And this is not something which is just uh, theoretical, but rather, you know, the presence of that authority means that people can live m something much closer to normal life um, in the Rojava area, which is not a bad uh, achievement given that the rest of Syria, you know, is in a state of civil war slash uh, chaos and anarchy. You know, so to maintain that uh, possibility of normal life, which I think has been uh, established and created for the inhabitants of Rojava, is quite a significant achievement, and that I think is something which is uh, worth noting. Mm -hmm. About Turkey supporting those group who is attacking Rojava, Jonathan Spire said. Just one th more thing with regard to the Turks. I mean, I remember mm -hmm. when, when the fighting was going on around Serekaniya, of course, Serekaniya is very close to the border, mm -hmm. and there was quite uh, clear evidence emerging that, that wounded guys from the jihadi side were being taken out across the border to hospitals you know, on the Turkish side and the equipment was coming in you know, also for them uh, from Turkey and into, into Syria or into, into Rojava. So I think the evidence there is pretty clear. Jonathan Spire spoke about the failure of Geneva II conference. To me, the, the failure of the Geneva conference was uh, ensured in advance. And I even wrote about it and I, I wrote an article called Geneva, an exercise in futility prior to the conference even taking place and it was one of the easiest predictions mm -hmm. that I've ever made because it was clear it was going to fail. For what reason? Because you know, conferences in, in conflict uh, uh, situations can get somewhere if one of the sides is winning mm -hmm. on the battlefield and therefore the two sides come to the conference table understanding that one side is going to get its way and the other one has come to negotiate a deal which it has not much choice but uh, to accept. But that's not the case in Syria. In Syria, both the Sunni Islamist rebel side mm -hmm. and the regime side both consider that they can win or th that this war eventually and certainly that they're in no danger of losing it. Mm -hmm. and, that's it. and both of them actually are right. That's to say that effectively there's been a stalemate in this war in Syria for the last year and a half, basically since the summer of 2012. The lines have hardly moved, actually. Mm -hmm. So given that that's the case, there's no reason why either side should feel the necessity to surrender any of its basic 
demands to the other side. And since the basic demands of the two sides are completely irreconcilable, it's fairly clear that there won't be an agreement, since one of the sides is obviously dead set on the survival of Assad regime and that Bashar Assad will be able to continue as president. And since the other side is very obviously entirely in the business of ensuring that that's not the case, there's no basis for agreement between them. It was obvious before Geneva and it rapidly became obvious in Geneva. Mm -hmm. Which is why what they did was they reduced the definition of success at Geneva down to something almost ludicrously low. They ended up spending several days talking about whether or not a, f a number of, of small uh, a convoy of aid mm -hmm. could enter one neighborhood, a couple of neighborhoods of Homs City. And if they could do that, then they could say we've had a successful conference. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, it's a very laudable goal to bring aid into Homs City. But th if this has become the definition of success mm -hmm. of an international conference, I think that just shows how unsuccessful it's been and uh, how unsuccessful it actually was. He told us about the reason not allowing the Kurdish delegation to participate the Geneva 2 conference. Because the opposition is opposed to uh, the, the Rojava. Mm -hmm. They regard it as a threat to themselves. And, and the regime, of course, you know, because they regard it as a separatist, at best as a, as a separatist project. Mm -hmm. And they also, as you, as you all know, when you to hear the official version of the opposition vis-a-vis -vis Rojava, they claim that it is... Uh, it is uh, an enclave which came into being to support the regime. This is clearly nonsensical, but this is what they say. They call it, uh, refer to it as Shabiha. I've, I've interviewed Arab rebel militia leaders in northern Syria who refer to the Rojava and to the YPG as Shabiha, that's to say, as, you know, as, as regime hirelings, as regime uh, operatives. You know. yeah. So I think this is, the, from their point of view, that's the reason. And of course, from the regime, regime point of view, they have no interest in uh, allowing Rojava any more authority than it already has. So in this respect, and I think people concerned for Rojava should take note, in this respect, the regime and the opposition were exactly on the same page. The Human Rights Association, IHD, has announced its reports on rights violations in 2013. During the year, 44 people were extrajudically killed and 33 people died in prison. 269 women were murdered. The IHD held a press conference to highlight its 2013 human rights report. IHD President Öztürk Türktuğan announced the report at the meeting attended by IHD Executive Council member Sevin Salioğlu and IHD Sears branch chair Veta Aydın. Türktuğan drew attention to the process of dialogue between Kurdish leader Abdullah Öcalan and state officials and the ceasefire declared by the HPG and also mentioned the Gezi resistance as one of the significant incidents of the year. Took to unlisted rights violations that occurred during the Gezi resistance. Nine people died as the result of the government's authoritarian response to the Gezi resistance. 9,564 people were injured in 774 demonstrations and 6,977 people were arrested, of whom 187 were remanded in custody. As far as we have been able to establish, 3,276 people have been tried in 78 cases. Turtuan said 44 people had died and 82 people had been wounded in extrajudicial incidents. In 2013, 19 people, two of them children, were shot dead for not complying with orders to help, 19 were wounded. Two people were shot dead and five were wounded by village guards. 22 people, three of them children, were killed and 58 were wounded by soldiers in border areas and one person was killed by private security guards. We wish to state that the most important reason extrajudicial killings in Turkey cannot be prevented is the culture of impunity. The decision by the military prosecutor to take no further action in the Roboski massacre demonstrated that impunity is a state policy and that rights violations are systematic as regards the Kurds. Turkuan give further figures and numbers. Attacks by unknown persons, 18 dead, 4 wounded. Armed clashes, 29 dead, 7 wounded. Suspicious deaths, 30. 
33 died in prison, seven of these died of illness, one died after setting himself alight in protest at prison conditions, while 25 committed suicide. The prisons continue to be one of the most significant source of rights violations on account of the penal system in Turkey being inhuman. According to figures compiled by the IHT Prisons Commission in November 2013, the condition of 162 out of 554 sick prisoners is grave. Öztürk Türkluğan said the total number of prisoners in Turkey was 144,178 at the end of 2013. 1,987 of those were children, of which 1,558 were on remand, while the remaining 429 had been convicted. There were a total of 3,060 instances of rights violations in Turkish prisoners. Turk Tuan drew attention to increase in violence towards women and children. According to our data, while 177 women were killed at home or in public space in 2012, this figure rose to 269 in 2013. In 2012, there were 48 cases of women committing suicide, while in 2013 the figure was 52. The socially conservative measures of the government have not prevented violence against women. Yasal altyapı ile ilgili önemli adımlar attı. Bunu kabul ediyoruz. Peki uygulama? 556 women had suffered rape or indecent assault. According to IHD data, there were 12 hate murders committed and 14 people wounded in such attacks. The European Court of Human Rights ruled that Turkey violated the rights of Uğur Kaymaz 13 and Ahmet Kaymaz who were killed by a police raid in Mardin province in 2004. Following the incident, the mainstream media initially covered the incident as two terrorists were killed, according to a first statement by the Mardin governor's office. ECHR ordered Turkey to pay for damages to the following applicants. Makbule Kaymaz, 65,000 euros as pecuniary damages and 50,000 as non-pecuniary damages. Emine Kaymaz, 5,000 euros as pecuniary damages and 15,000 as non-pecuniary damages. And Reşat Kaymaz, 5,000 euros as pecuniary damages and 15,000 as non-pecuniary damages. The court ruled that the raid operation has not been held in a fashion where casualties could be minimized and it didn't require any lethal intervention. ECHR also ruled that the local court in Turkey constructed the incident plot only through the statements of suspect policemen. The suspect statements were taken with a 10-day delay. This alone proves how authorities did not take precautions on the issue, the verdict said. It also stated that suspects changed their statements and told two different stories which contradict each other, especially on the location of bullets. The Turkish authorities have freed the sons of two former cabinet ministers pending trial, the latest twist, in a major corruption investigation. Barış Güler and Kaan Çağlayan arrested in December among dozens of people held in an investigation into bribery relating to public tenders. The inquiry enraged Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who saw it as a plot against him. He responded with a purge of top police and judicial officials. An Azeri businessman of Iranian origin, Reza Zarab, was also released on Friday. The son of a third cabinet minister was also arrested in December, but was soon released. The three ministers, Environment Minister Erdogan Bayraktar, Economy Minister Zafer Çağlayan and Interior Minister Muammer Güler, resigned in December as the police investigation intensified. All three of them denied any wrongdoing. Police are investigating allegations of illicit money transfers to Iran and bribery for construction projects. Earlier this month, Suleyman Aslan, the former chief executive of Halkbank, was also released. He is suspected of money laundering in connection with the alleged bribery. 
When they searched his home, police found $4.5 million in cash hidden in shoe boxes. Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan made a speech during a AKP political rally in Balkesir. Erdogan attacked Middle East Technical University students who resisted the building of a highway passing through the university forest, which caused the destruction of hundreds of trees. Erdogan said that, we opened a boulevard in Ankara on Monday, despite the resistance of leftists, atheists and terrorists. I say that our youth do not have Molotov cocktails in their hands. Our youth have pens and computers. Actually, Middle East Technical University is academically one of the top universities in Turkey, and it has an history of political opposition and being a left-wing habitat. Middle East Technical University has a big stadium, and its name is Revolution. Thousands took to the streets in the many provinces yesterday to protest against the government in relation to the ongoing bribery scandal. A large number of protesters in Istanbul were attacked by police as they wanted to march from Galatasaray Square to Taksim, calling on the government to resign. Many were taken into custody while many others built up barricades and clashed with police using fireworks and stones against rubber bullets, tear gas and pressure water. Police forces in the capital Ankara also denied protesters permission to march from Kul Park and Guvan Park to the central Kuzilay Square early Saturday evening. At least 20 protesters, including university students, were taken into custody following the police crackdown. A number of workplaces, including cafes and bars, were also targeted by police which made people in the area strongly condemn the brutal attack against the demonstrators, demanding an end to the theft of the AKP government. Turkey's parliament has passed a bill to shut down private preparatory schools, many of which are run by influential Fethullah Gülen. Fethullah Gülen is embroiled in a bitter feud with Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who was accused the U.S.-based cleric of plotting against his government. The schools are a major source of income for Fethullah Gülen's 50-year-old Hizmet service movement. The law says the schools must close by 1st of September 2015, local media reported. Millions of students attend the schools to prepare themselves for entrance examinations to win limited spots at state secondary schools and universities. Recep Tayyip Erdogan has said that abolishing the preparatory school is part of a reform of an unhealthy educational system that ranks Turkey below most other developed countries in literacy, maths and science. Until recently, his met has generally avoided overt involvement in politics and Fethullah Gülen still denies he madless. But tensions between the former allies were exacerbated in 2013 when thousands of alleged hizmet sympathizers in the police and judiciary were demoted while prosecutors with alleged links to the movement aggressively pursued investigations against allies of the prime minister. Now, commenting on this and many other subjects, uh, joining me now, uh, chef editor of Syndica.org and Chapulja TV, Ali Ergin Demirhan is on the line. Good evening to you, uh, Mr. Demirhan. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Demirhan, to start with, there is so much is happening in Turkey. It's kind of hard to catch up the developments. To start with, I would like to ask the suspect jailed in a vast corruption investigation that has shaken Turkish government have been released on parole pending trial. What do you think about this to start with? And uh, we, we have known these corruptions uh, for years, for the last 10 years. Uh, but the new thing is that uh, there is a political crisis that means uh, the Justice and Development Party cannot rule uh, the Turkey from now on because uh, the, for the last uh, two years uh, there were many crises uh, 
uh, about the foreign policy, about the Kurdish policy, mm -hmm. and uh, the anti-democratic uh, policies of Justice and Development Party and uh, the ruling classes, uh, so that uh, it is impossible to go with uh, Justice and Development Party. So uh, first USA and then the Gulen movement mm -hmm. uh, intervened, uh, intervened uh, Justice and Development Party because uh, with the June revolt, with the Gezi protests, uh, they saw that uh, we need, uh, Turkey need a new country. The people of Turkey, the, uh, the majority of the people uh, in June said that uh, we don't want this government. Uh, the, the oppressed ones uh, don't want this government. And now the ruling classes uh, don't want, uh, don't want uh, just... Uh, Tayyip Erdogan uh, and Tayyip Erdogan uh, went to hold all the uh, the whole uh, the whole state, so uh, it created it created a crazy crisis, and uh, the, the operation uh, by and Mr. Demirhan, can I just ask started. another? Can I just yes. ask another question? What will be the result of the corruption investigation? Do you think? Uh, the result uh, is the polarization of the society. Now we say we, we see a crisis in state mm -hmm. and a polarization in society. Uh, the, the, the ruling parties base is very strong now, uh, still very strong because the polarization uh, is a good thing for uh, Erdogan, and so he he goes uh, goes. He went to polar, polarize uh, Turkish society to uh, gain the support of the voters in the next elections. So he thinks that uh, he can uh, he can overthrow throw all the uh, uh, all the uh, enemies of uh, justice and the open party, and uh, with a victory uh, in the elections, uh, he he will he will go to. Uh, counterattacks against the social opposition, the social democrats, the uh, and the capital, the, the big capital, the bourgeois, big bourgeoisie, and also the Gulen movement. So now uh, there is, we, we you know that there, there wasn't uh, a there wasn't freedom, there wasn't democracy, and there wasn't a clear government. There were corruption, there were fascism, and. Uh, these these were the reality of the last ten years, but now uh, now we see a government holds all the power, mm -hmm. all the power, and uh, they, there is a civil war, a kind of civil war uh, within the state, and mm -hmm. now uh, there is a civil war within the state, and there is a huge uh, reaction, there are huge uh, opposition movements in the streets now, uh, last two days. Uh, there were thousands of people in streets in uh, over 10 cities of Turkey, mm -hmm. and uh, in the capital city Ankara, there were clashes yesterday. Any injuries on. regarding on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any injuries? Uh, do you have any information on that? Sorry, I couldn't hear the last question. Uh, is there any? You said that there is there are clashes, uh, is which has taken place uh, all around in Turkey. Is there any injuries? Uh, do you have any information on uh, regarding on that? Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, there is a problem mm -hmm. about the phone. Uh, I is can't there any, hear you. Okay, that's fine. Uh, lastly, uh, to um, what's uh, what's are your uh, prediction regarding the March elections? When you look at Turkey's current atmosphere, in the March election, it is very early to say uh, something about the March elections. Uh, uh, we have um, uh, we have 30 days mm -hmm. uh, before elections, and the operation by Gulen movement and uh, the other forces, other secret forces against government, it goes on, mm -hmm. and we will see uh, new corruption scandals about uh, candidates. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there is no file now uh, opened uh, about the candidates, because uh, it was possible for just a development party to change the candidates. Uh, but now, from now on, from uh, after uh, the 
second day of March, mm-hmm. it will be impossible to change uh, legally the candidate. So we will see new, new scandals about uh, just and development parties candidates. So uh, it will affect uh, the uh, choice of the voters. Mm-hmm. And uh, Erdogan thinks that if, if he gain over 40 percent, uh, he can go on. But if he can't uh, gain 40 uh, percent, uh, it will be very hard for him to uh, stay uh, at power. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, now the research polls show that uh, Erdogan still uh, protects, uh, still maintains. Uh, the uh, the support of his voters, but mm-hmm. uh, all the intellectuals, uh, all the social opposition, and all the parliamentary opposition says that uh, there isn't, uh, there is no legitimate government from now on. Mm-hmm. It will be a big dictatorship. Yeah. Uh, if if he uh, whether he gain forty uh, percent uh, or not, it will be a dictatorship. Uh, but uh, we know that, and we said that. Uh, as uh, social opposition, uh, these government uh, uh, saw his end, uh, saw its end in due revolts, mm-hmm. and uh, the ruling class said that it will be impossible to go with uh, Erdogan. Uh, I don't know when... Uh, uh, Mr. Demirhan, I've got limited of time. I've got one more question. I've got limited of time. Just one more question to ask you, then I'm going to have to say goodbye. Uh, what is uh, the general attitude of the media in Turkey? What is alter- what's alternative media attitude to- has towards the current situation within the AKP government? Uh, you asked about the media? Yeah, the media's attitude towards the, uh, the current situation. Uh, the media, you know, uh, it's a divided media. The, the media about uh, supporters of the Gulen movement, the mm-hmm. others uh, are supporting uh, just the development party, a big uh, p- proportion of the media, mm-hmm. and the uh, big bourgeois media, the three, three main groups uh, in uh, mainstream media. But uh, after, after uh, June revolts, uh, people... Uh, people understood that the mainstream media uh, isn't the uh, source of real source of uh, the reality. Mm-hmm. Uh, so people uh, follow the news from internet, from uh, Facebook, from YouTube, social from media. Twitter. Mm-hmm. So uh, the media of people and the operation, you know, operation goes by social media. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, I uh, I believe that the most important uh, media uh, will be in this operation process, in this uh, civil war process, and in this uh, people's protest process. It will be the uh, social media, the most important media. Uh, chef editor of Sendika Org and Chapel TV, Ali Ergin Demirhan. Thanks for your participation and thanks for joining us. Thank, and I thank you. Good evening. Good evening. This was it from us. We will see you next week at the same time. Thanks for watching us.